Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today I have another special guest with me, Dr. Matt Flummer. We're going to be talking about uh, historical conditions for uh, moral responsibility, some more free will kind of stuff. It's going to be really, really fun. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, if you are a supporter on Patreon, I just want to give you guys a shout out. Thanks so much for, for making this possible. Uh, I have supporters um, on Anchor as well. Thank you, guys. If you guys like this podcast, consider becoming a supporter over there on Patreon. The link's in the description or uh, on Anchor. So um, there's my little my little spiel, my little pitch. Uh, without further ado, let's jump in. Matt, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm a fan of your podcast. I've been listening for a while. I love that. I think that's so hilarious because <laughs> I listen to your podcast. Um, uh, I, I didn't say this yet, but but Matt and uh, Dr. Taylor Sear, uh, they have a podcast called The Free Will Show, and you guys are coming up on your second season already. Yeah, the, the next episode or the first episode for season two is going to be released on Monday. Okay, that sounds awesome. Yeah, Keep, I'm pretty uh, excited. Do you have a favorite guest? Are you allowed to talk about your favorite guest from last season? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I really enjoyed talking with Linda Zagzebski yeah. about God's foreknowledge and free will. She was such a great guest. Um, I also like talking to Dana Nelkin about moral luck. Um, yeah. Those two were probably my favorite two to actually do. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I was listening to the, the one with P- PVI. And yeah. <laughs> uh, I love that dude, man. He's he's in like the the grumpy old philosopher face, and those guys yeah. are so funny. I love them. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it kind of fit your preconceived notion. If you know who Peter Van Inwagen is, right. then that that episode fits with the preconceived notion of yeah. The, that's of, what you're he, he was for. yeah yeah. When you look at P, when you're looking for PVI, that's so funny. I love that. Uh, and, and Matt, so uh, I was talking to you off offline um, or off air about this. I usually listen to your voice uh, and I see Taylor cause he's come on before, but then to see this, this grizzly mountain man, come on, it's, <laughs> it's great. It's awesome. You got a good look on. Yeah. I've had the beard for a while, but the, with Corona, it's given me an excuse to grow it out even longer. Yeah, man. You got the plaid going too. I love that. You can uh, chop wood and then talk about if you were free or not uh, to chop that. That's wood. exactly what I do. I live out in the country. Okay. And there's a, I live in California in the middle of a bunch of orange groves and my neighbor uh, knocked down his orange grove and said I could have as much firewood as I wanted. So every day I would, you know, do my philosophy thing during the day and the afternoon <laughs> I would go cut wood. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's keeping you sane. So he cut down the whole... He cut down all of them. Yeah, they, they a, uh, a new neighbor bought the property next door, uh, and they they have horses, so that they removed the orange grove and they're dang. putting in pipe fencing for the horses. That's crazy. Well, Matt, uh, before we jump into like the the free will stuff, well, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, uh, where'd you do your undergrad, your master's, PhD? If you did a master's, um, yeah, tell us about yourself there. Yeah, I, I grew up in Alabama, and hated philosophy when I was an undergrad. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't know why I hated it so much. I was not a very good student to begin with. Mm. Um, I took one philosophy class in undergrad on contemporary moral issues mm-hmm. and just, I just was not in the right place. It's probably a combination of, I didn't like the professor and I wasn't in the right place. Yeah. Um, and took a break for a few years after undergrad and started to think about I didn't realize what I was thinking about, like theological and philosophical issues. Yeah. Uh, Like God's foreknowledge, God's uh, providence, um, the problem of evil and how all these kinds of things are reconciled and free will was kind of in the background of all those things. Totally. Um, And I actually wanted to study theology first. So I, I, my first degree or my first postgraduate degree um, was from seminary. I, I did an MDiv at new orleans baptist seminary whoa okay and while i was there i took a few philosophy classes and realized that the the questions i really had were not theological questions but philosophical questions yeah and i had already planned on doing a phd but at that point it was going to be in theology and i switched over after those uh philosophy classes i knew I, since i didn't have an undergrad in philosophy i didn't think i'd be able to get into a good phd program so I ended up 
uh, doing a terminal master's at University of Missouri St. Louis mm -hmm. my, in philosophy. Wrote my thesis on autonomy, so kind of got right into it yeah. from there, and then got into the PhD program at Florida State, where I did a PhD or I did my dissertation on moral responsibility with Al Mealy there at Florida State. Legend, yeah, yeah, man, that's awesome. So, so you did? Did you finish your MDiv then? Hmm? Okay, yeah, dude, that's interesting. I'm. I'm following the same kind of trajectory. I got to, to seminary here and uh, I was I was encouraged by some philosophers that I love to go and do some theology work, learn some Greek, learn some Hebrew, because we already have enough philosophers who are Christians who kind of just went off the rails and, and weren't. Really <laughs> <laughs> they said, we don't need any more of those guys. Go learn your theology. And so I, I listened to them and I did. And then being here, I've kind of been like a Oh, philosophy wannabe in exile. Uh, yeah. All my papers, I make them about philosophy if I can. And uh, and so, yeah, Lord willing, I'll, I'll go on and do a terminal master's as well. So it's good to, to know that someone else did that too. Yeah, I, I was clueless when I started thinking about these things. I don't even know. I guess it's God's providence. I don't even know how yeah. the idea came into my mind. I remember telling a friend of mine that I wanted to learn systematic theology, and I didn't even know what systematic theology was. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And yeah. so I didn't know that there were different kinds of degrees that you could get. I didn't know you could get an MA in theology. I yeah. thought, well, if you're going to study theology, you got to go do an MDiv. So I went right. and did, I did an MDiv. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't until I was almost finished. I was like, oh, I could have done an MA and been <laughs> out of here in two years instead of four. That's right. Three. Yeah, man, that's that's funny. It's it's funny how how you change so much, dude. And now you are a philosopher. Like that's yeah. that's pretty wild. If you would have told your younger self that, he'd laugh at you. Yeah. Yeah. I never right. would have believed if, if I time traveled and told myself my younger self would not believe my older self. Yeah. Yeah. It does, it's wild. So um, we've, we've also talked a little bit about this, but I thought it'd be worth bringing back up. So where, where are you at on the, uh, the old age old question there about free will compatibilism? Uh, we're going to get into like the historical condition, but uh, I thought you had a, a pretty, pretty funny answer there. Yeah. The, 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 I got this joke from one of my seminary professors when someone asked him if he was a Calvinist. Um, so if you ask me if I'm a compatibilist, it depends on which side of the bed I wake up on. If I wake up on the wrong side of the bed, I'm a compatibilist. <laughs> if I wake up on the right side, I'm an incompatibilist. Um, but like I was saying before, I've been thinking about the free will problem for, I don't know, close to 10 years now. And to take a line from Peter Van Inwagen, it, it almost seems too hard for me. I, I just don't know what to believe. And maybe I'm, I'm under, I'm, I've served under or studied under Al Mealy too much because officially he's an agnostic when it comes to the compatibility, compatibility issue. Yeah. But if you, if you talk to him aside from his published work, he's actually a compatibilist. Okay. Um, but this, this view that he has, I, we'll get into this later, but he's, he's agnostic. And he actually gives views for libertarians and for compatibilists. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why I brought that up. But anyway, I well, I have yeah. these intuition, really strong incompatibilist intuitions when it comes to free will and moral responsibility. But I also have other commitments like um, when it comes to God's sovereignty and things like that, that kind of pull me back towards compatibilism. Yeah. And the, the, art, the philosophical arguments on both sides, I find really compelling too. And I guess part of it is like, man, I just think all these arguments are good and I, I like them yeah. all and I don't know what yeah. to, to think. Yeah, dude, I'm the same way. And and uh, yeah, it's so funny having friends in theology, having friends in philosophy and them arguing, you know, one's arguing scripture, one's arguing history, the other's arguing philosophically and just kind of getting pulled apart in every direction. And it's, it's kind of awesome because I'm like, I love what you said, man. That sounds awesome. And then the next guy comes, he was totally wrong, dude. And go, okay, well, tell me. Let me let me hear what you have to yeah. say, too. Yeah, it's it's fun. I love guys like Mealy who who do put forward different arguments. Uh, I think Paraboom is kind of like that where he just wants to shoot everyone down. Where, mm -hmm. where, and I love that, too. It's like, well, I'm going to go at you. I'm going to go at you and you. So that's that's uh, it's always fun to see those kind of guys. But today we're going to be talking about some of your own work on uh, historicism. So I thought maybe um, you could just tell us, you know, what what is the historicist uh, condition for moral responsibility? What the heck did I just say? Uh, yeah, let, let's back up just a little bit. 
Yeah. And it might be easier to start with it, other examples besides moral responsibility and think <laughs> about the difference between what, what are we talking about when we say that something's historical? We're not, we're not talking about what you study when you take a history class. Yeah. Um, there are properties that things have, and some of those properties are referred to as historical properties mm -hmm. and other properties are non-historical. Sometimes they're called snapshot properties. Snapshot, so an okay. easy example to think about is uh, something that's the, the color red, like think of a stop sign or something like that. Um, the it's being red has nothing to do with how it came to be red. Mm -hmm. How it came to be red is irrelevant to it's being red. All that matters is depending on your views about what color is, how the light reflects off of it and then interacts with our eyes, mm -hmm. something like that. And that's something that happens instantaneously or takes very little time. A historical property is a property that a thing has, and it does depend on how it came to be the way it is in order to exemplify that property. Um, one example that people in this literature use is, is the, a genuine $1 bill. So in order to be a genuine $1 bill, you can't just look at the time slice or snapshot properties that the thing has, like its color and the paper that it's printed on and things like that. Yeah. But you, it has to, in order to be genuine, according to you know the definitions that the law gives us, it has to be printed on genuine uh, printing presses in the authorized way. So yeah. how it came to be the way it is matters for what it is, whether it's a genuine US dollar bill, uh, $1 bill. Other examples um, you might think of like a sunburn. So there's lots of different kinds of burns, but really what makes something a sun is how a uh, sun, a sun, what makes something a sunburn is how it was caused, like the history of how it came to be. So you might have two different burns that look similar. Uh, they might hurt equally bad or damage yeah. the skin equally bad, but one of them was caused by a heat lamp and the other one was caused by the sun. So technically, the, the sunburn has to be caused by the sun. So yeah. it matters how it came to be the way it is. Okay. Yeah, that's good, man. This is just, that's that's so interesting. It's making me think like if you had a genie and you wished for a $5 bill so you could buy something out of the vending machine and he produced it exactly like, like that's a that's not a real $5 bill because it wasn't produced. Yeah, it's counterfeit. Man, I never thought about that. And yeah. you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Like if you had somebody who was an expert in, in analyzing counterfeit money, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. Right. And the only reason you know that the one from the genie is a counterfeit is because you have to know that it came from the genie. Yeah. Um, and it's not until you know that, that you know that it's a counterfeit. The, the molecule for molecule duplicate is not genuine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the historicist wants to say that more responsibility is like being a genuine one dollar bill, and it's not like being red. That yeah. how we come to be the way that we are matters for whether or not we're morally responsible. Yeah. Okay. And dude, before before um, like reading your stuff, I didn't I didn't even know what this was, but uh, but Taylor read my my master's thesis and was like, "Oh, you're a historicist." I was like. Uh, yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. So, so he was like, "Yeah, you got to talk with Matt." And so, uh, I'm I'm so excited to get schooled uh, by you here. So, um, so how else? How or is there anything else to add on historicism? Because um, I want to go into like why someone will reject it. But should we? Mm -hmm. Do we need to give a, a better clarification of the concept, or is that good enough? You think? Uh, maybe the only clarification that we probably could go with for now is what what are we talking about when we talk about more responsibility yeah that's good and you mentioned dirk paraboom and that's probably a good place to start because okay. when it, for anybody who's familiar with dirk paraboom he's a famous philosopher who has argued against moral responsibility mm -hmm. he doesn't think that anybody's morally responsible for anything <laughs> and the kind of moral responsibility that he thinks that is at issue that he thinks we don't have is the basic dessert sense of moral responsibility. Mm. So f free will is really complicated, but moral responsibility is just as complicated. If you get into the literature, there's um, lots of different things that we mean by that term moral responsibility. We can mean being 
and it, uh, the kind of thing that it makes sense to hold responsible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my dog chews up the furniture. I don't hold the dog responsible because it's the, not the appropriate kind of thing yeah. to hold responsible. Right. Um, but if my son <laughs> were to chew up a, the furniture, then I would hold him responsible because he is the kind of thing that is responsible. He's old yeah. enough. He understands that you're not supposed to do that. So you can't make a distinction between um, moral responsibility in the sense of the appropriate kind of target for holding responsible okay. or what it means to be a morally responsible agent. And then you can also think of hold actually holding people responsible for things. So it would be inappropriate for me to hold my dog responsible and, and target it with what are called reactive attitudes of blame and anger and, and you know, indignation. Um, and to hold a culpable where it might be appropriate for me to do that with my son in, in the appropriate circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so the basic dessert sense that I mentioned before with Dirk Pearboom, um is that you actually deserve to be held responsible. Mm -hmm. So you can be an appropriate kind of thing. You can be a human being who is, you know, appropriately knowledgeable and, developed and has the right kind of features uh, but it might not be appropriate to actually hold a person responsible because of certain things um would that be like situational because of the situation they're in or maybe yeah so uh some of the examples that people give are um like moral dilemmas like the if you've heard of the, the one where the you know the nazi comes to your door and say are you hiding any jews in here well yep. Should you lie or should you give up your friends to the to the Gestapo? Well, right. it seems like in a genuine moral moral dilemma, you're not you you have no good options. It seems like you're doing something wrong no matter what you do. Yeah. Uh, so one take on that is, well, yeah, you do something wrong, but we're not going to hold you responsible for that. We're not going to blame you. Um, and that that's the kind of one of the kind of ways where the two can come apart, where you are a morally responsible agent. Mm -hmm. You do something that we would normally hold you responsible for, but we're not going to hold you responsible in this case. Now, that's not the only way people interpret that. Some people say, well, it's actually not wrong to lie in that case. Yeah, right. Um, but, you know, that's a that's a debate that would that takes us too far afield. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then we're moving over into ethics a little bit, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, well, that's that's super. To me, um, historicism just seems right. It seems natural. So. Yeah, why would anyone reject uh, the historicist condition? That's a good question. And some people, when I told them what I was working on, they were like, is anybody not a historicist nowadays? And it's actually gained steam recently. Uh, Taylor, you, you mentioned him that you've had on your podcast before, my co-host for the Free Will Show. He's actually got a paper where he argues that you – Compatibilists should be non-historicists. I know, man. He sent that to me after he told me I was a historicist. I didn't have a chance to read it yet, but I was like, Dang yeah, it. yeah. So one one thing that I think it, it is kind of in the background, um, non-historicists think that they can capture everything that we need to capture without the historical condition. So all things being equal, you should have the simpler view and. Mm you know, a view without a historical condition is more simple than a view with one. Okay. Um, I think one of the other worries is if we're going to go back in time to ground more responsibility for how we came to be the way that we are, uh, this, like, at least this is one of my biggest worries is how do we get it started in the first place? Hmm. Uh, so if I'm going to give up another plug for the free will show, if, if you go back and listen to the episode we did with Al Mealy, this is one of the questions that we ask him and he's got in his book, free will and luck. He's got a, a section where he tries to show how more responsibility gets off the ground in the first place, because you know, if, if history matters, we're going to trace back eventually to the, to some historic uh, part in our own history where we are not morally responsible for anything when we're babies. Right. And yet somehow we grow into morally responsible beings. Well, how does that work? So it's it's not a it's not an easy question to give an answer to. Yeah. And some some people give arguments against the possibility of more responsibility on the basis of this this worry that we are not self-made like we um, 
didn't cause ourselves. We didn't um, have the right kind of history in order to ground more responsibility. So that's yeah. another worry. Yeah. Okay. Man, that's interesting. Okay. So, um, so, so someone rejects the historicism, someone rejects that. What are some of the other accounts of, of moral responsibility? Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a few different ways that you can go without having a historicist kind of view. Um, Probably the most famous one is Harry Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. Harry Frankfurt was a famous compatible or is a famous compatibilist um, who I, can't, I guess it kind of goes back to this historical view of compatibilism says that you're free, even in the case of even when determinism is true. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the I think I'm not up on the history as much as I should be. <laughs> but a lot of the historical folks said that there's this kind of um, freedom that we have when we do what we want to do and we're not being coerced or yeah. constrained or forced to do something. So this, this idea of acting from your own desires and doing what you want to do that Frankfurt picks up on this and he says, well, it's not just enough to do what you want to do. Um, we actually have to have a little bit more because even lower animals can do what they want to do. And we don't want to say that they're free and morally responsible, mm -hmm. but there's something special about human beings. We don't just have, the, these desires to do things. Frankfurt called desires to do things first order desires. Okay. So it's the desire to go for a jog or eat the chocolate cake. But we also, as human beings, have second order desires, which are desires about desires. So my my dog wants to eat the treat, but he, I don't think my dog has a desire about whether or not he should eat the the treat. He's or, not watching his weight, and if I if I have, he's, yeah, he's not more going right. through a reasoning process there. Yeah, but I have all sorts of desires about my desires. I have a desire to exercise and be more healthy. And mm -hmm. I also have a desire that those those first order desires to exercise are stronger and actually are more are, are effective yeah. and are actually move me to act. I have desires, really strong desires to eat chocolate. Um, that's like my favorite treat. But I also have second order desires about that desire that I, I wish it wasn't so strong and I wish it wasn't so effective so often. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Frankfurt's idea was these, you have to have the right kind of um, relationship between the first and second order desires. You have to, so if I eat the, eat the chocolate and I also have the second order desire that I want to want to eat that chocolate then in those cases where your first and second order desires align, you're wholehearted. And so mm. when I ate the chocolate, I wholeheartedly eat the chocolate. Yeah. And we could, we could um, frame that against someone whose desires aren't in line. And mm. one, one popular example that Frankfurt gives is the unwilling addict. So you have an, a, a mm -hmm. person who's an addict, they have a desire, a really strong desire, first order desire to take the drug, but they also don't identify with that desire at all. They have a really strong second order desire to not have the desire for the drug. Yeah. So this would be the stage where they go and get help or something like that. And, and for, if the yeah, well, are, are, are they are they um that would mess with the uh, moral accountability, right? Be because they have this this first order desire so strong or or something like that. Yeah. Um. It, yeah, it depends on how strong the desire, the desire is. Yeah. But for Frankfurt, the I think the important part for him is not necessarily the 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 higher the when the desires don't line up, you're not morally responsible. But I think it's more important that when the desires do line up, that you are okay. responsible. So it's like a sufficient condition okay. for for being free and responsible. Gotcha. Is that these when 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 the these desires line up and you are wholeheartedly in favor of this action then you're, do, you're doing it freely and mm -hmm. you're morally responsible for doing it. Okay. And that, that hierarchy, sometimes this is called a hierarchical view, mm -hmm. the hierarchy of first and second order desires when those line up, um, it doesn't happen instantaneously. I, and maybe we could back up a little bit and talk about this, um, but it doesn't take very long and okay. it doesn't really matter how you came to be with that hierarchy of desires. That's why it's not historical. Right. Uh, I wanted to back up just a little bit. I didn't mention this. Um, David Zimmerman actually has a paper on this where he argues that just about every view 
history matters a little bit because deliberating and making decisions and thinking about what you're going to do is, is temporally extended. It takes time. Mm. So everybody's a historicist to a certain extent because okay. deliberation is, is temporally extended and it takes time, but that's not the sense at issue with the debate between non-historicists and historicists because even Frankfurt could, could allow for that. He's like, well, yeah, you're thinking about what you want to do and you're, you know, your desires are working in the back of your mind and you're thinking about whether you actually really do want this desire to be effective and move you to act. Well, that takes time. But having that hierarchy is what's important. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how you came to have that hierarchy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Yeah. We think discursively. Everyone acknowledges that. Not a problem. Okay. But it's about yeah. what where the priority is given. Yeah. Right. Okay. So other views that are non-historicist, there's a, a, a strain that goes back to philosopher P.F. Strawson. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that kind of coined these terms about reactive attitudes when we hold each other responsible. Okay. We express reactive attitudes of like blame or gratitude that are sometimes they're, they're morally charged. But that's kind of what we're doing in our in our practices of holding each other responsible yeah. is directing these kinds of attitudes towards people. And his view, the or a lot of the views that have come out of Strassen's writing are called quality of will accounts. Mm -hmm. Because when you act badly towards someone, you are displaying a bad quality of will towards that person. And so it's appropriate in the, in the normal circumstances to direct negative reactive attitudes towards the person who displays the bad quality of will towards you and mm -hmm. vice versa if they do something really nice for you and display a good quality of will towards you, then we direct the good kinds of reactive attitudes like praise or gratitude towards them. Yeah. And the quality of will is something that you have at a moment or a short period of time. And it doesn't matter how you came to be the way you are. All that matters is that you display a good or bad quality of will in that action. Okay. Is the, is the reactive attitude, um, does that matter? Like, are, are you free to, are you free in the, the way you react or does he not really mess with that? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I teach this paper every semester to my undergrad students and I'm trying to remember if he actually says anything about us being free in our reactions. And I think he would say, yes, we are because he says that we can suspend the reactive attitudes okay. in certain circumstances. When we find out, that someone is not an appropriate target of the reactive attitudes, we take what he calls the objective stance. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like we've got this choice to make where you know, we're, we're faced with evidence that somebody has acted badly towards us. And we look at the evidence of whether or not they're an appropriate target of reactive attitudes. And if they're not, if they are um, not mentally capable of understanding what they did, or if they were forced to do or coerced into doing what they did, yeah. then we we take a step back and uh, adopt the objective stance and treat them not as someone to hold responsible, but as someone that either needs help or um, training or education or something like that. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah, that's really interesting. So okay. those are probably the, the two most prominent um, non-historical kinds of views. Now, are, are there people who are like still putting those forth? Like are there Strassonians still? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. Um, Michael McKenna is a compatibilist who wrote a book a few years ago um, called Conversation and Responsibility, where he gives a Strassonian view of responsibility. Okay. Um, Matt King is another prominent non-historicist. Um, I think he's a quality of will theorist. So all that matters is that in your action, you display a certain quality of will, and then it's appropriate to react in, in the appropriate manner towards the quality of will that you had. Okay. As long as you meet all the other non-historicist conditions for responsibility. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we probably, I probably should have asked you this sooner, Matt, but um, so we, we've been talking about moral responsibility here and not free will. Um, yeah. So, hmm, for for the listeners, um, well, this is I, I I guess this is for me. Um, 
would you would you call yourself a philosopher of free will or are you like a philosopher of moral responsibility? I know people usually don't <laughs> people usually don't parse that out, right? But yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, because if I, I took a seminar in grad school on moral responsibility and it was more of what moral responsibility is. Uh-huh. And we didn't talk about free will much at all in that class. Right. Um, in the sense that kind of where I'm coming at this from is is more free will. So I guess there's there's different ways of looking at this. Um, you can look at this from like the ethics side of mm-hmm. what more responsibility is, and you can look at it from the metaphysics side. Um, and I kind of tend towards more of the metaphysics side. Okay. That I'm I'm thinking about what conditions have to be met in order for someone to be morally responsible, and this is usually where free will comes in. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of times free will is characterized as the control necessary to to be responsible for what you do. Yeah. Um, I mean, free will is not only that, but right. it's an important part of it. So usually they go together. So if I told somebody, I would be like, oh, yeah, I work on free will and more responsibility. Yeah. But my my dissertation's title is actually more ha- has more responsibility in it and right. not free will. <laughs> yeah. Well, I ask because I, I always end up stepping on the, the rake in some way or the other where I'll, I'll be tracking with someone and then they'll be like, oh, dude, that's free will. We're talking about moral responsibility. Like, Dang it. Well. Okay, so it's 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 always uh, important for me to to make sure that I'm tracking well. We're talking about moral responsibility here, and not necessarily free will. But would you say that? Because again, these are two different; uh, they're they're closely associated, and closely related, and interrelated. But um, is is one more foundational than the other? Like, is is free will a necessary condition for moral responsibility, or moral responsibility a necessary condition for free will, or? Well, when you ask a philosopher that kind of question, the natural answer is, well, it depends. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> depends on who you ask. Yeah. So I mentioned Pierre Strassen already, and mm-hmm. he thinks more responsibility would come first. Mm-hmm. Uh, his famous article that I've mentioned before, um, uh, Freedom and Resentment, mm-hmm. the, he says that our, our concepts of moral responsibility come first. And we we see ourselves as as moral resp- morally responsible agents like that's a big picture of our self concept as human beings yeah and he even Person, goes so far as to saying like what's that it's persons probably because he's he's so yeah. into person personhood stuff yeah, yeah. so it, it like like it's almost like life wouldn't be worth living if we didn't have these really rich practices of holding each other responsible for what we do. Like this is part of what makes life worth living. It's also part of what makes us who we are as human beings. Yeah. Um, And then, you know, whatever kind of control we need, like we will have to figure that out because we can't get, we can't give up this view, even if we tried that we are morally responsible beings. Yeah. Um, Other people are going to say, well, no, the, the free will comes first. And this is a lot of free will skeptics go this route. Like you tell me what's required for being morally responsible. And then we're going to go back and see if we actually have that stuff. And so they have these really elaborate arguments yeah. to show that we don't have free will. And as a result, we're not morally responsible for anything that we do. Yeah. Ooh, that's really interesting. But yeah, I've, I've mentioned this in my podcast before, but that, that, that reminds me of um, uh, Methodism and uh, particularism in, in epistemology, whether you're going to start with the things we do know and then build up mm-hmm. a, a thing or, or you start with the uh, the method and then you see if you can fit in what you think you already know and that seems like the the free willer uh the the free will types who are uh, at least free will skeptics are saying we're taking this system first and then we're going to show you don't have moral responsibility because the system fails and the moral res- uh, responsibility folks are saying no we have to we start with this i think of like c.s lewis mm-hmm. and his moral argument would say this yeah know? absolutely c.s lewis is a good example so in mere Christianity, he starts with this concept. We all believe this. Right. Like, and gives these examples. Like if somebody took your seat on the bus and you're yep. like, hey, that was my seat. Like, that's, yeah. a, that's, that's not right. And we, we try to hold them responsible. Yeah. And we just take this as a given. Peter Van Inwagen uses examples like this too. Okay. That in our normal everyday interactions, when somebody does something bad, you, you like automatically assume that they're morally responsible for what they do. And this is just a part of the way that we live as yeah. humans. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, and I you 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 said you can't help but do that. I think that's so interesting thinking about someone who would who would deny that who would, uh, and then you slap them and they're like, well, hey, what, <laughs> what the heck? It's, it's, not, it's not the yeah. best way probably to prove, it, but it's it's an interesting point. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so we have that. Um, 
Is it worth going into uh, what you characterize as, as new uh, dispositionalists, or, or should we just keep rolling? Um, I think we can keep rolling. Okay. Um, if you're interested in that, we're uh, the Free Will Show will be in, will be uh, interviewing Kadri Vivalin, who has okay. written a book on dispositionalism. I don't think she likes to call herself a dispositionalist. That one's hard to say. Yeah, probably because it's so um, hard to say. Yeah. yeah, probably. But her view usually is categorized by everybody else as a dispositional view. Would, would that be the new the new variety? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because that is like I'm assuming there's an old uh, dispositionalist. I, yeah, I, I'm not an expert on dispositional compatibilism. I'm hoping to learn more about it when we talk to Kadri. I actually read her book. Um, and yeah, that's part of research for this, but you just think about, uh, uh, maybe it would be helpful to talk about dispositions in the first place. Like sure. you know, a sugar cube has a disposition to dissolve in water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and even though it's not actually being dissolved at the moment, we, we know that if it were to be dunked in water, it would dissolve. And so it's got these properties that can exemplify at different times in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I think what the dispositionalists are up to is saying, well, we have these kinds of properties too that are actualizable in different ways in different circumstances. So it's like a power to do certain things in certain circumstances, even yeah. though at the present moment, we're not actually doing it. Yeah. And we might not ever be in that situation, but we have this power. And so we can, we can characterize it as a disposition. Man, that is interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to that, uh, that, episode already yeah that that so uh, that's like more in my head i'm thinking that's metaphysics mm -hmm. that's uh that's yeah she calls her view metaphysical compatibilism okay okay yeah that totally that totally clicks for me which would be different than like pro attitudes which seems to me more like epistemology uh it, you could go that route um pro attitudes are usually defined as um like a desire would be one species of a pro attitude yeah so it's having it's having a kind of direction to that mental state. Yeah, but like sugar um, sugar cubes aren't having pro attitudes, but they have dispositions. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That that's in my head. That's why I'm categorizing like epistemology versus metaphysics. Like, doesn't matter the uh, cognitive state of of a sugar cube. It's because <laughs> it, it, that's its disposition yeah. in water or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. We talked about dispositionalism, even though we weren't going to. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just happens that way yeah well so let's go on to uh tracing cases uh and manipulation versus non-historicism so people denying histor the historical condition this is this is going to get fun uh there's these two problems for them so can you list those for us or, or help us think yeah about? you could say that these are the two main arguments for historicism the the tracing cases you maybe it would be better let me back up just a bit yeah, yeah. so let's say that that some non-historicist has some conditions that they say are sufficient for being morally responsible for something, mm -hmm. or maybe they have some, these conditions are necessary for being morally responsible. Yeah. So Frank, I, I list, I mentioned Frankfurt as someone who has conditions that are sufficient for holding somebody responsible. If you have the right kind of, of hierarchy in your first and second order desires, when you act, then you are morally responsible. This is sufficient for that. Mm -hmm. Others are going to say something more like, well, these are the things that are necessary for moral responsibility. You have to have, you know, X, Y, and Z. Would, would Strassen, the Strassen's conditions necessary? I feel like he would be a necessary condition guy. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Right off the top of my head. Yeah. Sort of um, yeah. Okay. You, know, you made me lose my train of thought. I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about um, tracing cases first. So tracing cases are designed to show that those, those features, whatever they are of moral responsibility are not necessary because mm -hmm. you can have an agent who is morally responsible, yet they don't meet the conditions. Yeah. So imagine the, the, this is the example I use in my dissertation. Imagine two drunk drivers who are equally smashed and they drive the car and they both run over the pedestrian. Mm -hmm. um, the first driver, has freely gone to happy hour after work, or he did, and he freely got drunk. Nobody forced him to do anything. Knowing, knowing the dangers of drinking and driving, he didn't set up anything beforehand, didn't call the Uber, whatever. He 
got behind the wheel, he drove home and he ran over a pedestrian. These are the, the you know, the paradigmatic cases of people we want to throw the book at when they run over somebody, right, the totally. drunk driver case. Now imagine there's an old Alfred Hitchcock movie where this actually happens, where okay. someone um, gets kind of kidnapped and force fed alcohol and then placed behind the wheel of a car that's been started. And they're so roaring drunk, they don't know what's going on. So they just try to drive home. Yeah. Well, if if you think that the second driver who was force fed alcohol and placed behind the wheel is at least a little bit less responsible than the first, then it seems like we've got a problem for the view that says that these conditions are necessary for being morally responsible. Because when you're that roaring drunk, you probably don't meet the conditions. Yeah. You know, you're not in your right mind. Yeah. And and that's why the historical uh, condition is so important because both at the time, neither one fits the condition of moral responsibility because they're so plastered, but you just start tracing that back and right. you say, well, at one point before you were drunk, this guy made a choice. This guy did not make a choice. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So that's why they're called tracing cases because we can't trace back to an earlier decision for which they were morally responsible, <laughs> whether it's getting drunk in the first place or going to the bar without a backup plan to get home safely. Yeah. And so we hold them responsible because we can trace it back. Yeah. Okay. So, man, I wonder how you'd get around that. Like what, you'd have to bite some pretty hard bullets. I well, think. philosophers are very clever. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the main way that you can get out of this is make a distinction between what's called direct responsibility and indirect responsibility. Mm -hmm. okay. And they want to, you know, the people that, that come, well, this is actually a really helpful distinction. So it's not like this is, you know, uh, a bad argument. Sure. Um, when the drunk driver who was force fed alcohol behind, or excuse me, the, the first drunk driver who freely got drunk, when they ran over the pedestrian, they were only indirectly responsible for running over the pedestrian. Uh -huh. The thing that they're directly responsible for is yeah. the earlier action, the, ac yeah. the actual decisions that they made. Yeah. So usually direct responsible, re direct responsibility is tied to mental actions like decisions and choices. Yeah. And we're indirectly responsible for everything else that follows those decisions and choices. Okay. Yeah, that's that's helpful. So that yeah, they didn't make a conscious decision to run over the pedestrian. So they're not directly responsible for that. It was an accident. Or not an accident. This is a good distinction to make. I yeah. tell my kids all the time this no, it's, it wasn't an accident if you're negligent or reckless. <laughs> yeah, right. And right. so this guy was either negligent or reckless. So he did even though he didn't intend to make the choice, he's indirectly responsible. And then we can trace back that to a choice he did make, mm -hmm. which was going to the bar without a backup plan to get home. So um, how does indirect responsibility like get them off the hook? Because when they made the choice, they did meet the conditions. Okay. So, um, okay. So that, that would make a, a significant difference between the, the force fed and the, yeah, I guess I'm not seeing that part of it. So yeah. the So the, the person who freely chose to go to the bar, yeah. the, what we're holding them responsible for is that choice at the beginning. Okay. Okay. So, so I guess the, the hook that you could rehook them on is you don't charge someone for like manslaughter or something then mm -hmm. because what they, if they're indirectly responsible and so no one's going to jail for, for drunk, for hit and run or drunk driving or something. Well, we, we might still hold them just as responsible for stuff that we're indirectly responsible for. Okay. Because the, this distinction, it, the where we draw the line is stuff that's overt. So all of our bodily actions are going to be things that we're indirectly responsible for. What we're directly responsible for is choices that we make. Okay. And everything that kind of causally flows out from those choices will be indirectly responsible for. So it's not we're like we're going to be any less responsible for stuff that we're indirectly responsible for. Yeah. We can still be responsible to like the maximal degree. Okay. Even though we're only indirectly responsible for it. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I, I don't know why I'm not catching it though. I don't, I still see like a big, I still see a, uh, the, the tracing condition, the, the tracing mm -hmm. problem between the two situations that one 
is not even indirectly. Oh, would they say that the one who is force fed is indirectly responsible? Mm -mm. Okay. So then there's no, yeah, there's nothing to trace back to. Yeah. Right. So you still have, so I, I, and it seems like they haven't got past the tracing argument then. Yeah. We, so in, in one of my papers, I, I pull this move where even if we do make this distinction between direct and indirect responsibility, yeah. that there are, we could do the same thing, the kind of tracing that we need on, in deliberation. So someone who maybe has a drug, you know, a, a bad guy comes in and, and, and injects them with some kind of drug that makes them not be able to think straight. Mm -hmm. And we have another person who freely takes the drug that makes them not be able to think straight. And then later, while they're under the influence of this drug, they begin to deliberate about what to do. And so that deliberation process that is um, temporarily extended, um, we can, we, we're going to have to trace back within the deliberation process. So yeah. this is all stuff that's happening in your head. Yeah. And so we're still going to need tracing in certain cases. Nice. Yeah, even yeah, with yeah. the distinction. Yeah, that's good. I was thinking about that with the drunk driver, if he had intended to hit someone. Um, yeah. So in the story, neither one of them intended to right, hit anybody. Right, yeah. right. But I was thinking, yeah, yeah. And and so I'm catching the, the drug analogy because that that is really interesting. Man. Okay. It's it's it's. It's crazy that uh, all the problems are so gruesome. Like that's, uh, <laughs> that's like yeah. what philosophers talk about. Alvin Planning would talk about that here and there. Just the gruesome nature of these uh, philosophical puzzles, which is so funny. Yeah, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because gruesome cases elicit stronger intuition. I think that's probably it, right? Yeah. We yeah. don't want to say, well, you know, one person got drunk and then sold Girl Scout cookies. Right. Are they right. responsible for that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you want that visceral reaction and intuitions. Okay, so um, let's go with, have we sufficiently covered historicism or um, tracing? Sure, yeah. So those are the cases that are designed to show that the non-historical conditions are not necessary because we can hold people responsible for things that they do even when they don't meet those conditions. Yeah. And then, uh, then we have manipulation, right? Yeah. Manipulation cases are designed to show that certain conditions aren't sufficient for morally for moral responsibility because someone can meet those conditions and because of manipulation, they are not responsible. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll, I'll give a plug for one of your previous episodes. When you talk to, let me see if I can say his name, right? Guillaume. Yep. Guillaume. Yep. So Guillaume and, and you talked a lot about manipulation cases and it was, mm -hmm. I thought it was really excellent discussion. And one of the things I like about what Guillaume has done is call attention to the there's different kinds of ways to present the manipulation argument. Yeah. And he talks about the difference, like one way to do it is with an analogical argument. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that's not the only way. Hmm. And so in the manipulation arguments for incompatibilism, some people might present it as an analogical argument or some people might. And this is the way it works in historicism, too, is you take. So you ask the compatibilist, like, all right, tell me what your conditions are to be morally responsible. Whether, you know, whether it's reasons, responsiveness or quality of will or whatever. Yeah. And then you construct a manipulation case where somebody meets those conditions. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, well, <laughs> I met this guy, this guy that's being manipulated meets your conditions. Is he yeah. responsible or not? Yeah. And depending on the details of the case, if you if you construct it right, there's this a really strong intuition because they end up, you know, murdering somebody because we got to make it gruesome. Yeah, always. Um, they're like, oh, yeah, he meets the conditions, but surely he's not responsible because he was manipulated into doing it. Right. And so it works as a counterexample to the compatibilist conditions for moral responsibility. Yeah. And so Al Mealy has some great ones. Um, in his 1995 book, Autonomous Agents, he comes up with a case where it's just like overnight where we, we take a, a, an agent who is morally responsible and we kidnap them in their sleep. And then we do some extreme value replacement. So we hire neuroscientists and psychologists who are experts in all this stuff. And we imagine a possible world where all this stuff is possible. Mm -hmm. And they come in and you know do their thing, planning electrodes and erasing values and replacing them. And we make this person who was a nice person into a psychological value twin of Charles Manson or somebody like that. Yeah. And then they get up the next day and go murder somebody. Mm -hmm. 
well, when they murdered somebody, um, the part of the story is, well, they met all these conditions. They have first and second order desires like Frankfurt wants or their reasons responsive like Fisher and Visa want. And yet they were manipulated. And yeah. it seems like they're not morally responsible for what they do. So it seems like a genuine counterexample to the compatibilist sufficient conditions for more responsibility. And when you say to, to the compatibilist, do you mean um, specifically the the uh, A or the non-historicist uh, compatibilist or is this compatibilism like simplicator? So yeah, at this, at this stage, it's the non-historicist one. So okay, we'll take yeah. somebody like Frankfurt and like, all right, you say that this is um, the conditions that need to be met for responsibility. Well, here's this manipulation case where the agent meets your conditions. Yeah. And yet they're manipulated into doing what they do. So you want to say that they're responsible. Right. Right. And so you're faced. Uh, Michael McKenna has a paper where he says that the two main options here for the compatibilist are to go hardline reply and say, well, you just got to bite the bullet yeah. and this person's responsible. And that's the way Frankfurt d goes. He's like, well, you know, as, as long as they've got the right hierarchy of desires, they're responsible. And yeah. that's the bullet I'm willing to bite. The other option is to go soft line reply and try to point out some condition that the agent who is manipulated hasn't actually met. And so then we can say, well, they're not actually responsible because they haven't met this other condition. Right. And then yeah. the question comes, well, what's this other condition? And historicists say it's a historical condition. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I like that, man. Yeah, that's good. What uh, when I read um, McKenna and Paraboom's Free Will, I think McKenna suggested that we take a hardline reply. That like any compatibilist take that. Yeah. So in the end, this this is McKenna's take that uh, he's got his his famous reply to Paraboom, mm -hmm. the the four case argument, and this is where the the distinction between hard and soft line replies come up that the in the steps that compatibilists need to take in response to the manipulation argument, the first thing that you need to do is make the manipulation case as good as possible. So this is like a, a good strategy of argumentation. Let's not do a straw man. Yeah. Let's let's steel man. Yeah, let's do a steel man and let's make the manipulation case as good as possible. So if the the incompatibilist didn't get your compatibilist view right, then change the case around until they do get your your compatibilist view right yeah and at that point so eventually mckenna says we're we're all compatibilists are going to have to go hard line eventually okay. because eventually the incompatibilist is going to come up with a manipulation case that gets the compatibilist conditions right mm. and at that point you're left with nothing but the hard line reply so just go for it right away yeah yeah i think i think taylor goes that route mm -hmm. okay yeah, I, yeah I, I, most I, compatibilists. So um, in Al Mealy's book, Free Will and Luck, he's got this argument called the zygote argument. Mm -hmm. It's not really he doesn't claim that it's a manipulation case because it starts from the zygote stage. We're not talking about kidnapping somebody in their sleep and manipulating them overnight. Yeah, we're talking about manipulating the zygote. And he says, well, you know, in this case, we have this godlike person who yeah. arranges the atoms of someone's zygote mm -hmm. at the very beginning, together with their knowledge of the laws of nature and the history of the universe, they can guarantee that this person is going to do some action in 30 years. Mm -hmm. So he's like, well, it's not technically not a manipulation argument because in order to be manipulated, the person has to exist and they're arranging zygotes from the molecule stage. They don't really exist when we start putting together molecules. Yeah. Um, but what we call it, I guess, is not important. Like a lot of people call it a manipulation case. Yeah. We call it original design case. It work. It functions like a manipulation case where we go. We, uh, this is one thing that Paraboom tried to do. Well, instead of having manipulation happen all at once, we have the manipulation take place in an earlier time. Mm -hmm. And so there's this time lag that happens between the manipulation and the action that the manipulator wants the manipulated person to do. And their characters being formed such that they will do that. So it makes it more, yeah. makes it trickier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so that's, you know, that's the kind of case that even historicists are going to have to bite the bullet and say, well, yeah, you got my, you got my conditions, right? So yeah. I, either that, or you have to come up with some other way of getting out of the problem. Yeah. That I remember, I remember reading the Zygote case and thinking if, 
because that's similar to like I'm I'm a theological com, uh, com, uh, determinist, and so the the God analogy, it's like okay, well, um, the I would because I, I like reason reasons responsiveness, and so I would say that like the the reasons that if if that female goddess was controlling the whole universe and going through uh, going through the zygote, see, this is why I think it might be different. The I think the difference between like the God of the Bible that that I think is a theolo- is a determinist and the uh, I forgot the do you remember the goddess he used just the, Diana. The, 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 Diana. Okay. Yeah. So, so Diana, Diana says from this moment, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put it here. And she's kind of like, um, a deist God. It seems like she knows all the conditions are going to fall apart. They're going to, I'm going to do this right here. And then it's going to happen 20 years from now. Whereas like, you know, God of the Bible is, uh, providentially controlling everything, including the reasons and the situations that the person responds to. Mm -hmm. But I also, I also want to say there's asymm- asymmetry between sins and good things, and we can we can talk about that later. Yeah, can... there's there's a lot of asymmetries between Mealy's zygote argument and the goddess that he has in there, Diana, and yeah. you know the god of Christianity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you could, I mean, you could easily change the case to where Diana does providentially yeah. put her hands in at every stage. Yeah. Um, or you could set it where she just sets the the ball rolling and then kind of steps back and watches it all take place. Yeah. I don't think that's a necessary feature of the argument. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll think through that some more off offline here and see if I can soup it up to, <laughs> to, to account for mine. Yeah. That'd be really good. Um, okay. So uh, we feel good about manipulation here. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cause, cause I wanted to, if you have time, can we go, uh, do you have, do you have a couple more minutes here? Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm going to talk positive because now there's different types of historicism as well, positive, negative, and mixed. Mm-hmm. And I uh, just wanted to briefly cover those and, and say, what what are we talking about again? Yeah. All right. So I, uh, in previous episodes, you've talked with a person who was a reasons responsive kind of Fisher and Revisa style compatibilist. Mm-hmm. So you guys have already talked about this on one of your episodes before. Yeah. Um, but the basic idea is that, you know, the condition that needs to be met in order for you to be responsible is that you have to be appropriately responsive to reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, And usually this is characterized in a way where we bring in possible worlds and we've got this for Fisher and Revisa, there's this mechanism, which is a way that action is brought about. And you could think of, it could be something as normal as deliberation or whims or a direct stimulation of the brain, like hap- what happens in manipulation cases. Yeah. Um, and so the mechanism, in order to be reasons responsive, has to, in some other possible world, be. F- you could think of it like a function. Like it has to be fed in different inputs of reasons. Yeah. And give different outputs. That's mm-hmm. the way we want a good function to work. Yeah. If it has different out inputs and it always gives the same output, then it's the it's a kind of something a boring broken function. Or, yeah, yeah it's something fatalistic or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, fatalistic would be a good way of thinking about it. Um, but reasons responsiveness is not enough, and so this is where the historical position comes in. And so Fisher and Revisa say that we've got these mechanisms that we act on, and not only do they have to be reasons responsive, but the person has to like take ownership of it. And so this is why it's positive, because there's something that the agent has to do in order to take ownership of this mechanism. So when I act on regular practical deliberation, it's the same mechanism, the practical deliberation that I always do when I think about what I should do. And I've got a history of of deliberating this way. Like, yeah. I, you know, as far back as I can think, like I've been deliberating about what to do. Yeah. So there's this long chain of evidence that I've built up where I can say, oh yeah, that's 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 on me when I deliberate and make a bad choice because I deliberated and I made a bad choice. But and that's the way I always deliberate. Yeah. It's it's the mechanism that I normally use to to decide what to do in these kinds of cases. Um so the, there's actually several different dimensions to taking responsibility. Mm-hmm. Like one of them that you guys have talked about before was you have to see yourself as an agent. Yeah. Um, this view of yourself has to be based on evidence, like I said before. So that we've got these different kinds of 
of ways of thinking about this, taking ownership of the mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the reason why this one is called positive historicism is, is because it requires you to have a history. You have to have a history of that, that gives you the evidence that you are an agent, an agent that mm -hmm. is an appropriate target of reactive attitudes and that you know you you recognize that this is your own mechanism that you are acting on yeah that so th yeah, that part that part freaks me out a little bit because I, I'm, I'm thinking i like it but it freaks me out a little bit because i'm thinking like epistemology and i'm like well what what position would this force me to be like would i have to be an internalist then i have to be aware of my reasons or be aware of my be aware of myself while i'm acting all the time and i have to know that i'm constantly i'm constantly like reflecting on myself and i don't know it's kind of weird um i i don't know if they were it's been a while since i've read the the fisher and revisa book yeah um so i'm just going off of of memory here mm -hmm. I don't know if it has to be conscious. Okay. So it could be just you have this view of yourself as the source of your behavior, um, even if it's like an unconscious view where you're yeah. not actually thinking about reasons and thinking about yourself as an agent. Okay. Um, but when somebody asked you, well, what'd you do that for? And you're like, well, because, you know, I thought about these reasons yeah. X, Y, and Z, and I did it this way. That's not so bad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah so it doesn't not... have to be anything spooky. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Well, I, so uh, let's talk about some problems for that then. Let's, because uh, yeah. I am very partial to this view. So maybe you can disabuse me or, or give me some more stuff to, uh, to to mull over here. Yeah. One one problem is so this sometimes called the subjectivist view. Yeah. Because this is something that you have to see in yourself. Um, and one problem is imagine somebody like Dirk Paraboom, who has been convinced that nobody. Ooh. is a fair target for reactive attitudes. Like he's not crazy. I've met him before. He's a nice guy. I talked <laughs> to him on the podcast. Yeah, right. He's very reasonable. Yeah. Um, and he thinks he's got like knockdown arguments that n nobody deserves praise and blame. Nobody, no, the, the basic dessert sense of moral responsibility is not appropriate yeah. in, in the real world. Like he says, maybe there is some possible world where we've got some special agential, ag agent causal powers. Yeah. But this world we don't. And so yeah. we're not responsible for anything. So he doesn't and see so, himself as a Dirk Paraboom doesn't yeah. see himself as a fair target for reactive attitudes. So wow. according to Fisherman Revisa, he is not responsible for anything he does. Wow. Dang. That's wild. I wonder I, I wonder have they respond like do they respond to that? Oh, there's you know, this is we're talking philosophy here, of course. <laughs> there's like because Fisher and Revisa's book came out. Um, like over 20 years ago. Yeah, some, some like 92. So there's like back and forth, back and forth, yeah. back and forth. And Fisher has actually said that he's willing to give up that condition. Okay. That, oh, yeah, I mean, we can't let Dirt Paraboom off the hook that easy. Right, like, right. Well, of course, he's a morally responsible agent because he's reasons responsive. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't think it would be that big of a deal to just give that part up. Good. For, for in the cases of people who are convinced by philosophical or even theological arguments that nobody is a fair target of reactive attitudes. Would you just give it up in those cases or just give it up in general? Because if there's you one. You just case, give it up in general. Yeah, that's right? what I was thinking. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because it doesn't work for everyone. Okay. Yeah. Or you could, uh, yeah, it'd probably be easier just to give it up or, yeah. or tweak it a little bit to say. Yeah. To account um, for him. Yeah, to account for that. Where you are, even if you don't think so. That's yeah, like, because yeah. He, just because you falsely believe you're not a fair target doesn't mean yeah. you're not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, is is there any more problems you want to go with, or or could we? Um, there's also Susie Instant. That you yeah, brought. that's that's the big argument that leads people like Al Mealy into negative historicism. Okay. So um, bring up Michael McKenna again. Mm -hmm. Mike McKenna came up with this uh, thought experiment. Imagine someone who was created instantaneously, and let's yeah. call her Susie Instant. Mm -hmm. But she is brought into existence with like a full range of psychological abilities, just like a normal adult human being. Yeah, like she's reasons responsive. She can deliberate. She's she act. I mean, if if your your view of philosophy of mind fits this, like she has knowledge. Uh, so externalists are going to deny this. Like yeah. She knows all kinds of stuff about the way the world works. 
and we just pump her up. That sounds bad. We just uh, install a bunch of false memories into her brain. Mm -hmm. So she thinks that she's got a history, but yeah. she doesn't. So the the evidence, this the Susie instance is not going to meet this view or the the part of the historical condition for a fisherman or a visa where she believes things about herself based on evidence because she has all the evidence is false. She has no evidence that she's yeah. ever acted anywhere because she's never performed an action. Yeah. But we would we want to say that somebody like Susie Instant it, can act freely, and if she went out and you know, uh, I don't know, volunteered a soup kitchen the next day, would we say that she's praiseworthy for that? Mm. And you know, a lot of people are like, well, I don't know why we wouldn't hold right. her responsible. And I, I've been thinking about cases like this in literature. Um, so, like Pinocchio would be an example of an instant agent. Um, I was thinking even Adam because yeah, um, that was the next one I was going to bring up. Yeah, so, well, was I'm Adam thinking, responsible for the first few actions that he performed after yeah. God created him? And 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 okay, so hopefully no one gets too triggered. But there's like this wild debate on young Earth versus old Earth creationism, and I kind of don't know where I fall. Kind of depends on the side of the bed I woke up on. Um, and before you you think you know those crazy fundies like there's some pretty good arguments, but one of the arguments they use is the appearance of age. That, you know, mm -hmm. if you, when God created Adam, you took a doctor from 2021, you brought him back in time and you asked him, how old is Adam? He'd say like 18 or something, right? Yeah. Um, sexually mature, probably. Uh, well, yeah, because right after that, he's having kids. So you go, ha ha, actually, it's, he's 30 seconds old, right? But right. but they, they, they would say, you know, God just put that all in his mind. I actually don't think so. I think there's this form of triangulation that God did when he brought all the animals in front of him and he had to form the concepts in his mind. Mm -hmm. I, that's really important for this argument. It's the theistic argument I want to have. So I, I need to hold that. <laughs> but, but so, so yeah, that would be, he would be Susie instant then. Yeah. That's, Except maybe he's not given like a false sense of history. That, that might be different. Yeah. I but, don't think, so this would probably go against a lot of people's view of what God's going to do. Like he's, he's not going to implant false memories right, right. into Adam and Eve, because that just seems to go against God's character in, yeah. in the way that it's presented in the. But we, in he would have all these concepts and and language that he didn't acquire through a process through a historical process, and so yeah, the, the externalists are going to be really upset. And it it probably depends on the details of the case because the the first two chapters of Genesis are notoriously not detailed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and so who, who knows what God did with him right, right. after he created him? Yeah. Maybe God did bring him through all the processes that are necessary. That's Maybe right. he and didn't. I don't know. I, I want to say that, but because I think that you would kind of run into this problem of he's he's having these ca these concepts he didn't earn, right? Like he didn't mm -hmm. get through this historical process. And that's, I think God's not putting false memories, so that's a, a significant difference between Susie and Sin. But, but yeah, sorry, sorry to derail us here. I thought that was so interesting. No, that's fine. I think it's interesting too, and I, yeah. I think Adam and Eve are like prime examples yeah. from, if you want to just call it literature, if you're not a, a theist, mm -hmm. or from like foundational documents of scripture, right. that it's possible that somebody pops into existence out of nothing and possibly performs some action, yeah, and possibly is held responsible for him yeah yeah P pinocchio is an interesting one did he have like a false history or i don't think he did um it's been a while since i've i watched the movie or read the little disney books with my kids yeah um but i, I think at the moment he was given life or whatever you want to say yeah he just kind of danced around and sang yeah and it was a while after that he started performing bad actions <laughs> yeah 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 that's true Okay, so so how do we how do we get maybe we we were about to get there we didn't but maybe we did how do we get how does Susie Instant get us from positive to negative again? So the one of the lessons that I guess you could you could take from a Susie Instant type case yeah. is that if if it's possible for Susie Instant to be morally responsible for what she does, then it is not the case that we have to have a history. Yeah. Yeah. Does that hinge on your like intuitions? Like, or is there more, is it, is it more forceful than that? Cause right now I'm just thinking like, well, I don't think it's possible, but could they like pin me? And I'm sure Mealy could, he's pretty sharp. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure what, to, I know it, 
a, a, a big part of it is going to be intuitions about a case. Okay. Um, so we're presented with this case. What's your intuition about it? Yeah. And for a lot of people, I think they're like, oh yeah, we can, we can hold an instant agent responsible. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what else we could say if you don't share that intuition and maybe we just come, sometimes they call this a dialectical stalemate. Okay. Where we're just, all right, we've got competing intuitions. Um, I don't know until we come up with another argument. I don't know yeah. what else to say. Yeah. This, cause for me, I'm like, I, 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 because of my priors, I'm, I'm thinking I wouldn't hold that person responsible if they've given, been given this fake history. And one of my philosophy buddies, uh, he's been on the podcast, Nate, like, like a brain in a vat. We, we talk about that. I'm like, I don't know if brain in a vat is possible because it doesn't have this historical, you know, dialectic and it's not forming its, its, uh, its categories, its concepts through a process. And he thinks I'm insane for that. And, that, <laughs> that goes on. and he's probably right. He's the philosophy student. I'm not, but, uh, that goes with your intuitions and your priors and what you're thinking and whether you're an externalist or internalist kind of interesting plays. And I, that's why free will and moral responsibility is so interesting because you got metaphysics, you got epistemology. You yeah, that's why I love philosophy it. Yeah. Of mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Donald Davidson has this old case too that's a kind of a case of an instant agent called Swamp Man. Right, right. He's right. trying to argue that the Swamp Man actually doesn't have any concepts because yeah. he's an externalist and he thinks that you have to have a causal process yeah. with the outside world to form concepts. And so the Swamp Man might be a, a duplicate of me, look just like me and react just like me, but he's not even a person. He's just kind of a, a thing, that, yeah. an automaton, we might say. Yeah, he's got no causal history. Yeah. 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 I, I'm not sure where I fall on that. Um, when I first read Davidson, I, I was convinced, but now I'm not so sure. Yeah. Well, was he arguing for internalism there or externalism? Because I know I know um, people have changed that argument to argue for external. I don't know. That's all right. Yeah, I can't remember either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Davidson. And he later like gave that up and regretted calling it Swamp Man. But um, so that's that's neither here nor there. So so we're at negative historicism now. We got mm -hmm. we got Mealy's autonomy, his self rule. Um, yeah, we got. I just pulled from from uh, your article and your in your dissertation there. Pro attitude, shed ability. Can you can you give us an overview of that stuff? Yeah. So um, Mealy takes the possibility of instant agents seriously mm -hmm. and at least like well yeah it's possible so yeah i'm going to hold out that since it's possible we need to come up with a different kind of historical view to account for the fact that some agents might not have the right kind of history in order to be morally responsible mm -hmm. but still be able to call this a historical view yeah so this this was um goes all the way back to 1995 in mainly's book i think i mentioned this earlier um, autonomous agents. Yeah. And it's actually part of conditions to be autonomous and not free will and not moral responsibility. It's slightly yeah. different, but it, w w it might as well be, we can, we can just substitute in moral responsibility for okay. what we're talking about here. Cause autonomy means self rule. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of, uh, being able to call your own shots and do what you want to do. So it's very closely related to what we're talking about here. All the theologians listening are losing their minds because that's a dirty word in theology. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So in order to be morally responsible for what you do, you have to authentically possess the pro attitudes that you act on. Yeah. And in order to authentically possess the pro attitudes that you act on, then it can't be compelled. And so Mealy takes this, this, this idea of compulsion that's got a really long history in, you know, discussions about free will because yeah. compulsion is the kind of thing that takes away free will. Yeah. So the way that he characterizes this is we think of um, in a manipulation case, there's certain aspects of your psychology that are bypassed yep. when they, the manipulators install beliefs or pro attitudes or values or desires or whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. And so to put it in a nutshell, Mealy's, Mealy's historical condition is it, you can't have this kind of bypassing in your history. Yeah. And so since you notice the way I phrased it is it's not what you have to have. Yeah. It's what you can't have. Yeah. And so if you imagine Susie instant who comes into a being in an existent in an instant, nothing was bypassed because there was nothing in place. Yeah. So she's created with all of her psychological states 
you know, whatever you want to have in there, like beliefs and desires and everything. And because she didn't exist before that instant, she didn't have any kind of mental states that we could bypass in order to give her those mental states. So Susie Instant is able to, you know, be responsible because she doesn't fall foul of this no bypassing condition. And so yeah. it's negative because it doesn't require that you have a particular kind of history. It requires that you not have a particular kind of history, one that includes bypassing. But she she could be created, Susie Instant could be created with the, like pro attitudes of like genocidal rage, right? Mm -hmm. and, and she'd still be responsible for that because she was created with those. But then since then, no one has tampered with it. Well, it depends on what, uh, this is the, the philosopher cop out answer again. It <laughs> depends on what your, your your conditions for moral responsibility are. Because some people think that if you have genocidal rage, then you, so Susan Wolf is a philosopher who's got a paper on sanity and moral responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's going to say somebody that's got genocidal rage is arguably insane, like criminally insane. Yeah. And so they're not going to be morally responsible for what they do. So like Hitler then, or? Yeah, I'll get, it depends on the details of the case. So yeah. she's got this view, this uh, this guy named Jojo. I think uh, he was raised by drug dealers or something like that. It's been right. a while since I read her paper. Um, and just the kind of like cold, cold hearted, calloused killer that doesn't care about morality at all. Yeah, that was some and, good alliteration too, by the way. Yeah, I didn't even do that on purpose. <laughs> in the end of days. Yeah. Uh, so you think about somebody like that and... And I think that the people who think that sanity is a requirement are going to say something like, well, uh, we should definitely protect ourselves from somebody who has genocidal rage. Yeah. Um, but they aren't they aren't the, they're not appropriate targets for more responsibility. Rather, they're appropriate targets for like some kind of therapy to, you know, put them in. I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. uh, to try to fix them instead of trying to punish them yeah. and, and blame them. Because there's something wrong in their psychology. And I yeah. don't know if Hitler actually meets this condition or not. Or maybe with tracing, we can say, well, Hitler didn't meet it. It's his fault that he didn't meet it because we can trace it back to yeah, earlier. Yeah, 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 yeah. He made freely. He made himself into that yeah. homicidal maniac. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, I don't, negative sounds good. I, I like it. I, I don't know if it's enough. Yeah, that that's what I argue. So. Yeah. I, th I think it's uh, it's a really cool view to think about, um, but it only gives us this this one case or this one kind of condition in which moral responsibility is undermined. Yeah. Um, and we could co probably come up with other kinds of cases. Well, Mealy himself has came up with a zygote argument. Yeah. And officially, that's why he hasn't committed on mm. the incompatibility compatibility question because officially he says he's not sure what to say about the zygote argument because the agent in the zygote argument meets his negative historical condition. Yeah. Um, wow. So yeah, it's, we might want, we want, might want to say more about what's required yeah. for more responsibility yeah. than just saying what's not required or right. what, what undermines it. Um, does this bring us to, to mixed views then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a okay. good segue into mixed views. Okay. So the mixed view we could trace back to philosophers Ish Haji and Stefan Kuypers. I think that's how you say his name. I've never okay. actually met him. Um, and the mixed views also take Susie Instant very seriously. And so they propose, you could, some people think of this as like a helpful suggestion to improve Fisher and Ravise's theory of free will. Okay. Um, and so what, what Haji and Kuypers do is they, talk about evaluative schemes and an evaluative scheme is kind of like all the mental states that you have, like the psych psychological elements, we could call them that are used in order to evaluate reasons for action or yeah. something like that. Um, so beliefs about the world, about morality, about cause and effect um, values that you have and your desires. These are all part of your evaluative scheme. Mm -hmm. And they want to make a distinction between initial evaluative schemes that an agent has at the beginning of their existence and evolved evaluative schemes that agents have later after they have their initial one. They also want to separate the historical condition out 
from the control condition. So for Fisher and Revisa, the historical condition is part of the control condition. Yeah, yeah. And so Haji and Kuypers want to say, well, no, we need to separate these two. Control condition is one thing. So we can say reasons, responsiveness, or whatever you need to have control over your action. And historical part is separate from the control condition. So you can have control and not have the history in order to be morally responsible. Wait, you could have, oh, oh, they, they want to separate it out and, and take it away? The historical? Well, just just make a logical distinction between the two. Okay, but but so you, you can have you the right both, kind of. Con- right? I'm sorry. What did you say? You need both in order to be morally responsible. To be morally responsible, you need both. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. So the, you can have uh, an agent can have the right kind of control over their action and yet not be morally responsible. Yeah, so they want to point to manipulation cases. Yeah. As prime examples of people who have control, but they're not responsible because they don't have the right history. Totally. I love that. Yeah, that sounds really good. So the um, let me talk about evolved schemes first, because I think it's easier. The, okay. An evolved evaluative scheme is so Haji and Kuiper's characterize it as authenticity, too, um, or in it also. OK, <laughs> um, so if this is this. We, we talked about this with Mealy, like you have to be able, authentically possessing these pro attitudes that you act on in order to be morally responsible for them. Haji and Kuiper's use the same terminology, but they mean something slightly different. In order to be responsible, you have to act on authentic evaluative schemes. Um, and in order for your evolved scheme, the one that you have later in life, to be authentic, they're going to pull more from, from Mealy. You, the elements in that scheme have to be there in a way that they aren't bypassing your previous scheme. Okay. So they're using bypassing again. Okay. Um, so as long as when you add new elements or change elements out, as long as it doesn't bypass your evaluative scheme, your own you know capacities for de- deliberation or control over your mental life, then you authentically possess those elements. Okay. Yeah. But they, well, they said it evolves, mm-hmm. right? And I'm sure they're not saying like an infant has has these evaluative schemes, but it, at some point along the line, when you form, uh, you have that, and they evolve. So how is it that I don't know? Maybe they don't need a story for how it evolves, but you put something in there that's not that doesn't cohere with the whole evaluative system but it changes it and helps it evolve that that seems like it's okay whereas another one would would not be okay and i I wonder how they would distinguish between those two like new inputs or whatever coming in um that makes sense um so are are you asking um when a new element um of your evaluative scheme is acquired like how it's acquired authentically Maybe I'm just being. Uh, maybe I'm just confused between like the the uh, evaluative evaluative system, that's like the operating system, and then maybe the new thing coming in. Um, oh, like a new belief. Yeah, the new belief. But because I, to me, it's like the, the, a new belief could also alter your evaluative system. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. So if uh, if someone puts one in there and messes with your, if someone puts in a new belief, evil scientist, whatever. Uh, that is messing with the mechanism control, right? And 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 the historicity or the the historical view. Well, so let me see if I'm I'm, I'm tracking. Yeah. So uh, these beliefs that you have are, are going to be part of the the scheme. Right. Right. And so when you acquire a new belief, as long as it doesn't bypass your your previous scheme in the acquisition of that belief, then it's okay. going to be authentic. Okay. As long as and it, and I, the way that we thought to think about bypassing is like brainwashing or okay so um, that is that is direct it. brain stimulation like fisher and visa talk about that would be a way of bypassing and and bypassing by bypassing you would would they say that you're you're messing with uh ownership yeah or authenticity authenticity because yeah. you, you don't own that someone else owns that someone else's right. that's someone else's belief that they've been and so by adding that new one it is jacking up your whole evaluative system but if one it could in, yeah depending on what the belief oh, yeah. is okay yeah there's a chance that it couldn't. Yeah. I mean, if it's like an inconsequential belief, like, I don't know, are the, the stars even or odd? I don't know. <laughs> um, so if somebody implants a belief that the stars are odd, I don't think it's going to change my life very much. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, but if it's like about morality, like, 
well, lying is okay whenever you want to. That's going to be like big and it's going to yeah. change me a lot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it would, if it's significant, it would mess with the evaluative system, but your evaluative system can evolve and change. Okay. All right. That's cool. I got it now. All right. So that's the evolved evaluative schemes. Yeah. The, and the, the way they try to get around Suzy Instant is say, well, when an agent is created like Suzy Instant, they have an initial evaluative scheme. Mm -hmm. And in order for the initial evaluative scheme to be authentic, it must not include any elements that are authenticity destructive. Okay. So this, this is where it gets tricky. And I'm not sure I can explain it properly, but I'm going to try. Okay. So Haji and Kuipers have a forward, forward looking view of authenticity when it comes to initial evaluative schemes. Mm -hmm. So they say, well, you have to imagine when an agent is created with an initial scheme, they've got all these, these parts, it's the hardware and some software in this evaluative, evaluative scheme. And if any of those parts at the initial scheme will undermine responsibility for later behavior, then the evaluative initial evaluative scheme is not authentic yeah okay so if you've got all the stuff that you need in there at the initial scheme and none of the elements ever undermines future behavior then everything in that initial evaluative scheme is authentic so if susan instant was created with an evaluative scheme that requires everything you need it to require, and it doesn't include any elements that will undermine. I'm thinking of so an example of an element that will undermine responsibility for later behavior might be like an irresistible desire. So if we gave Susie Instant an irresistible desire to shoplift, then you literally cannot resist this desire. Then she's not going to be responsible for that one in the future. Okay, and, and because of that. When she shoplifts, that that traces back to this. We're getting into tracing again. It yeah. traces back to the initial scheme, and her initial scheme was not authentic because she was given elements that undermined responsibility for later behavior. Would that would that mess with um, all of her her culpability or just shoplifting? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure what they would say. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Like my first reaction is to say, well, since her initial evaluative scheme is not authentic, then yeah. it seems like it's going to undermine everything. That's what I was thinking too. Um, but that sounds like it's extreme. So maybe we can just say, I'm not, yeah, I have to look at, you ask good questions. I'm going to have to go back and see uh, what they actually say about some, these kinds of cases, whether okay. it's the whole scheme undermines, if, if the scheme is inauthentic, then it undermines everything. Yeah for responsibility sake, or if it just undermines the responsibility related to the actions that are acted You're upon from those yeah. elements. Um, yeah. I want to say it's the second one that it's just, you know, she's got this inauthentic element yeah. because it it's, a, they want to call this an authenticity destructive element. Um, yeah. And so you're not responsible for acting on these authenticity destructive elements. Yeah. Okay. Man. This, this is good. So you, it's so funny thinking about you um, in your first philosophy class. And now here you are talking about destructive elements. <laughs> and the instant. Like, just, yeah. I would love to just skip right there and be like, and here you are today. Yeah. yeah. So, awesome. uh, yeah, you should have seen the look on my parents' face when I told them I wanted to go to grad school for philosophy. Yeah. They were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, well, Matt, are, are you cool with the mixed ones? You, you cool being... Uh, so I I actually argue for a kind of a mixed view. Yeah. Um, but I reject the relational view that Haji and Kuipers have. Okay. And I've got a counterexample to their view where you imagine two agents with the identical ev initial evaluative schemes. Mm -hmm. So they all they both were think of qualitative identity. They both have exactly the same elements, all the same beliefs, all the same desires. Um, grew up in the same house. Let's call them identical twins. Yep. Um, even though identical twins aren't ever ident actually identical. These are you actual... Star Wars. Star Wars round. They're clones, right? Yeah, let's make them clones, right? Yeah. Even the clones are different, though, if you watch yeah, the clones. Yeah, but you could um, train them the same or something. This is a possible world where these two, uh, these two are qualitatively yeah. identical. When, when yeah, they're yeah. created at the initial same scheme stage. Mm -hmm. um, and let's give them like some kind of irresistible desire, like 
they have an irresistible racist desire and let's put them in Nazi Germany. Um, and they both hate Jewish people yeah. because they're, they're, they're both Nazis and they both have an irresistible desire to like belittle Jewish people. Yeah. Um, one of them lives, in, you know, lives the normal life of the Nazi gets a job as a guard at a concentration camp and every day just relishes the opportunity to make life hard for Jew Jewish people in the concentration camp. The other one starts to grow up and then tragically dies in an accident. They both have the exact same initial scheme, but because the first one acted on desires from his initial, initial scheme and they were irresistible, then he has an inauthentic scheme because it, or it includes inauthentic elements because yeah. he later acted on those. The other one, even though he had qualitatively identical evaluative scheme, never acts on them. So he has the exact same elements. His are authentic because he never acts on them later in life. Yeah. And it's this act, this, the, the way Haji and Kepers define the, the relational view of authenticity is that it's not authentic if it undermines responsibility for later behavior. Yeah. And so for the one who died young, there was no later behavior. He never, let's, you just suppose he mm. never even saw a Jewish person. So yeah, yeah, he yeah. never acted on this desire. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. That's, and so that's a counter example against their view. Yeah. Yeah. Dang, that's sweet. You got to come up with a good name for it though. <laughs> like you got the Clone Wars case or something. Yeah. 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 That's good. Man, I like that. That, uh, you got to, you got to come back on. We got to talk like, uh, you, have you watched the Clone Wars at all? I've watched a, a lot of it with my kids, okay. but I haven't watched them all. Yeah. I'm um, actually... I love it, but I, I am, I try not to watch too much TV. Yeah, <laughs> I, I feel know, guilty man. about I, watching I, so much TV. I hear you. I hear you. I'm the same way. I'm actually, uh, in a couple of minutes recording a podcast on, on Star Wars, nice. but, uh, it'd be interesting to talk about like the, the clones have this, I don't know if it's not a spoiler. But like Order 66, right? They kill all mm -hmm. the Jedis and they have like yeah. this chip in their brain that does that. Yep. That would be a fun one to talk about. Yeah, yeah. That, that that would be a fun one to talk the, about. The culpability of the, yeah. of the mm -hmm. Clone Wars or something, yeah. Yeah. Well, sweet, man. This has been huge. Th thanks so much for coming on the podcast. You're welcome. Uh, where can people find out uh, more about you or, or listen to some of your stuff? Uh, well, uh, check out thefreewillshow.com for the podcast. Uh, I also have a website. I don't really update it as much as I should. I, I should have had this. I don't even know what the website address is. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I think it's matthewflummer.weebly.com. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, if you just Google me, there's not very many flummers that come up in a Google search. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be the only Matt Flummer that comes up in a Google search. Ah, it's gold. That's awesome. Dude, this is, this is seriously, this has been a really fun one. Thanks for letting me uh, pick your brain and, and go off on tangents all over the place. Thanks for keeping up with yeah, me. No too. Problem. That was really fun. <laughs> I, I, uh, I love my, my gen Xers and my boomers that come on, but um, you're, you're, you have to be a millennial. No, you're I'm not? older than I look. <laughs> Holy cow, man. I, I just turned 44. What? No. Is, are you, are you with me? I'm, a, I'm a straight up Gen Xer. Wow. That's crazy, dude. You even like, so I was going to, I was about to say that the millennials usually stick with me and they're like cool going and saying they don't know stuff. So you, you're like a, at least an honorary one. I don't know how honorable that is to call you a, a, a millennial. Maybe that's dishonorable, but uh, yeah. dude, it's been, it's been really fun. I really appreciate it. I feel a lot of solidarity with the millennials. Yeah, I dude. I think Maybe it's because I'm like right on the tail edge of generation X. Sure. So I'm like almost in between. Yeah, yeah. You're in the no man's land. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Well, awesome. Uh we could we could talk about this more and uh someday we will. Uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll be talking about Clone Wars and Order 66 and all that good stuff, the the culpability there. But uh, for now it's gonna have to do it. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.